Great, thanks, Naeem. <clears throat> okay, so we're going to go through this and do this really quickly. And what I'm going to do is talk about venture finance and you know what is the idea behind venture finance? Why do we have venture finance? Why is this the way you're going to ultimately get financing for your business? How do they operate? How do they think? Right? And how has it evolved over the last 20 years or so? Um, so I got my training at Wharton. I taught at these other schools. These are some companies I've worked with. And we'll jump right in and talk about, uh, in the large idea, what is the difference between innovation and invention? Right? Do you consider yourselves an innovator or do you consider yourselves inventors? Okay, there is a big difference. Right? As scientists, you think of yourselves as inventors coming up with these wonderful ideas. But there are a whole heck of a lot of ideas out there, most of which are completely useless in the money-making sense, right? They don't have any capacity to monetize. They don't have any way that they can translate into something people can actually do and which will generate profits for your investors. So the entrepreneur, what does the entrepreneur do? The entrepreneur is typically not an inventor. An entrepreneur is typically an innovator. They are someone who brings together people, money, and technology into something that is uh, monetizable. Okay, so when we talk about technology, that's often where the invention takes place. Then there's money, okay, and those are where the venture capitalists come in. And then there's people, and those are the folks that you're going to ultimately employ. That's your, your team. And so it's the entrepreneur that sits at the middle of all this. And really what they are is they're, you know, shepherds. They're the ones that coordinate all of these, these different pieces. So, look, there's an opportunity. And by the way, this framework comes from uh, work of a couple colleagues of mine at, at Haas. Um, and so uh, uh, Jerry Engel and, and uh, Engel and Freeman, this famous framework. Uh, the idea is there's an opportunity out there, and somehow that opportunity has to be converted into value. So when you go and do your pitch, you say, look, there's this fantastic opportunity out there. There's, there's some problem that needs to be solved. That's fantastic. Great. Go create an NGO. We need to figure out a way to turn this into value. And that's really what entrepreneurship is, is all about. It's about coordinating these, these different pieces. So there are three key mechanisms to a successful entrepreneurial culture, which you'll hopefully insert yourself into. One is this idea of entrepreneurship, which you've been learning about, right? You know, the ability to accept failure, right? The ability to, you know, be self-motivated, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, we know about that. That all sits within this big ecosystem, and that's why you're here. That's why you're here at Silicon Valley, is to get a piece of that. But I want to ask you this. Who invented the light bulb? What? Not Edison, okay, good. Uh, the, the first wrong answer is Edison. Uh, the next step is not Edison. Well, well, who was it? So this is a list of all the different people that invented light bulbs. Notice how many there were before Edison came along, right? Nobody's heard of any of these people, and yet they're the inventors. So when we think of Edison, he's not the inventor of the light bulb. He is the innovator. He is the one that figured out a way to take these innovations through trial and error, and find just the one that was able to be a sustainable uh, business model. We've got other examples, right? You've heard of Xerox Park, super famous story here in the Bay Area, right? They invented tons of stuff. How many did they monetize? None of them, right? Steve Jobs walked right in. He saw all this cool stuff like, right, the uh, uh, you know, graphical user interface and the mouse and all that stuff, and he just stole it. He just walked right out and made money. Out of, out of these ideas, okay? So, you know, whether we're talking about uh, the Bell Labs or whether we're talking about, you know, Xerox Park, these were all places where there was invention, but these things were not monetized by those that invented. Okay, and the next thing I want to talk about is the alignment of incentives. In order for you to succeed, there have to be a whole lot of other people who are going to benefit when you succeed, right? You want there to be a lot of other people to get rich when you get rich. If you're the only one that gets rich when you succeed, then you will never get rich because you need everyone else to be rooting for you. You need everyone else to have some skin in your game, not just in their, their own game. So Steve Blank, who also teaches at Berkeley, he defined a startup as a temporary organization designed to search for a repeatable and scalable business model. Meaning that a startup is not a business. A startup is not a business model. It is this temporary thing that's searching, that's exploring, that's trying to figure out what works. So you have to have an experimental mindset, okay? And the VC is ultimately are those folks who are going to help you guide that experimentation. So here's the framework by Jerry Engel, right? It says, and this is from the perspective of the entrepreneur, right? There are these four stages that you're going to go through. And I think, you know, this lines up very, very nicely with what, what Naeem uh, talks about, 
right? And, you know, you've got the cash flow J curve, et cetera. But, you know, in the first stage of pure entrepreneurship, this is where you're really totally clueless and you're trying to figure out what is the idea of your business, where you develop prototypes and so forth. The next level is strategic focus, right, where you actually start incorporating some of this information that you're discovering, right? You figure out what business you're not in. You figure out what it is that you do better than anybody else. It's where you identify partners, right, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, okay? Then the next stage is system building. This is where you start to, you know, rinse, wash, repeat. You start to scale. Uh, and then ultimately the final phase is when you bring in the grown-ups. This is when you hire the MBAs, okay? And, and Naeem was talking about, you know, you bring in like an actual CTO, some experience, uh, maybe to do stuff uh, for you, okay? Okay, now, this framework is from the entrepreneur's perspective, but every stage along the way, there are gonna be these markers of success, right? You know, have you done this? Have you validated this? Have you gained traction? Have you gained scale? Have you gained predictability? But we're talking about venture finance, and every stage along the way corresponds to some level of staged financing. This is the key thing about financing. If you're a startup, as opposed to being right, some kind of scientist in an R&D lab, okay, the, the investing is staged, the financing is staged, and every step along the way, you have to demonstrate that you've succeeded in some way, or you've gathered information that justifies the infusion of additional cash by these investors. Okay, now this is unique, and this is the secret to venture capital success, and this is the secret to entrepreneurial success. It is this staged investment. So if I were to ask you, right, why would you stage investing? It's, it's quite simple. Um, you know, when I was a kid, I got an allowance. I don't know if you guys got allowances, or maybe some of you have kids and you give allowances. And I, and I said to my dad, I was like, look, you give me an allowance every week, you know, $15 a week. Why don't you just give it to me all up front? This would reduce transaction costs. Just give me a whole year of allowance on January 1st, right? One payment. Like, we don't have to keep going back to you every week, right? And, I, you know, from a finance perspective, it sounds the same. It's exactly the same amount of money, you know, time value money. I'll even give you a discount because time value money, whatever. My dad was like, you got to be crazy. Why would I give you all the money up front? Why does a parent stage the installments of the allowance? It's because they want to exercise some degree of control and they want to see right, what it is that you're doing with this money. If you understand that as a parent or as a child, then you understand venture capital in, in a nutshell. Okay, now look, at each of these stages, there are different people that give you money, right? So the friends, family, and fools are the people that kick in first. I always like to add in a fourth F, which is faculty, because as, as, a, as a faculty member, Right? I invest in a lot of companies, and you know, why am I, why do I have a competitive advantage in investing in startups? It's because I can see these students, I can see if they're lazy, I can see if they work, I can see if they have good ideas, and so forth. Right? Then we have angels, right? then we have incubators, seed investors, etc. But what I want to focus on is not the, the money, but what comes with the money, right? What comes with the money? The money does not come without strings attached. The money does not come by itself. It is money that comes embedded with expertise. Okay? It is money that comes with expertise. And in the early stage, the money is stapled to some form of mentorship. In the later stages, it's stapled with some form of, of, of governance. Okay, so as you go through the cycle of your business, from a glimmer in your eye to a nice mature business that you can sell off, the nature of the financing changes. Okay, oftentimes you'll start with, with private equity, then you'll go to public equity, and then maybe even in a very mature stage go back to private equity. Okay, so why is it that you have different people funding you at different stages? It's because the money comes with advice. And the advice that you get differs as you mature. So look, I am a university professor. But if I was in charge of educating kindergartners, I would do a terrible job. Similarly, if there's a kindergarten teacher out there who is forced to teach university students, they would probably also do a terrible job. So they can both be amazing teachers, but they are specializing in different stages of intellectual development. This is why there are companies and entities which specialize in early stage finance and some that specialize in late stage finance. If I took a company that was specializing in buyouts Right, where they bought out mature companies, and I put them in charge of startup financing, they would be a disaster. 
If I took a VC and I put them in charge of doing buyouts for mature companies, that would be a disaster also. Because money is not fungible. Money comes with, with advice. Okay? The reason why you go to get money is because you want the advice that is attached to that money. Okay? If someone offers you money without advice, you don't want it. Okay? That's a crazy counterintuitive thing to say. Because everyone thinks they want money. But no, you don't want money. That's dumb money. You don't want dumb money. You want smart money. So this is a phrase that you'll hear all the time here in Silicon Valley, which is, if you want money, ask for advice. But you're going to network with a ton of people. If you go up to somebody and say, hey, I got a great, I, here's my business, give me money. Okay, they'll be like, yeah, get out of my face. But if you go to somebody and say, hey, look, I got this business. I'd love to hear what your opinion is. Can you tell me, like, what should I do with this business? And people will talk to you, and then they'll get to know you. And they'll say, you know, if you're asking me for advice, you must be pretty smart. Here's some money. <laughs> right? Similarly, if, if you want uh, advice, ask for money. And typically, you know, they'll tell you to shove off. Right? <laughs> That'll be their advice if all you do is ask for, uh, for money. So look, I taught finance for many, many years, corporate finance. And I came up with this framework. And this framework says, if you're going to go and get financing, there are three questions you need to ask. And this is for any entity, startup, mature business, whatever. First question is, do you rely on internal funds or external funds? Second question is, if you're going to rely on external funds, should you structure it as debt or should you structure it as equity? Okay. And then the third question is, if you're going to get financing from outsiders in the form of debt or equity, should it be liquid? or liquid. So liquid in uh, the case of equity would be public equity, IPO. If it's in the case of a private equity, it's right, private equity, venture capital. Okay, if you're talking about debt, you can either have bonds that circulate or you can have bank loans. Okay, so these are the four forms of external finance. But the first question is, right, internal and external funds. So suppose that you're rich, independently wealthy. You've got a huge reservoir of cash that you can get from your own pockets or the pockets of your relatives, your uncle or whoever. Okay? Why would you want external money? Because right? a lot of times you ask someone, like, why would you ever raise external funds? It's like, well, because I don't have any money. I have to go to outside. I have to go to No, even if you have all the money in the world, you should be seeking outside funding. Right? Because you need to figure out whether your idea is any good. Now, if you ask yourself, is my idea good? The answer is always, heck yeah, right? Because we all think we're geniuses. And so when you ask yourself for money, you got any money? Yeah, I got some money. Here, let's take the money put it in your pocket. When you go to someone else and ask for money, they're going to ask a lot of difficult questions, OK? And if no one else will give you any money, your idea probably sucks, or you haven't done a very good job of articulating it, OK? So force yourself to go to outsiders and get money, even if you don't have it. OK? All right, now, once you've decided to go out and get some outside money, do you want to go with debt or equity? Okay, if you've got a startup and someone comes to you and says, hey, I'll give you a loan, okay, and this is the way people get financing in most countries. You know, in Germany or France, you know, you go to a bank and you say, give me a loan. OK, as a startup, you don't want to borrow any money. Borrowing money is terrible. OK, why? The way finance people typically think about debt versus equity is, oh, debt is for the low-risk people, equity is for the high-risk people. It's about volatility and standard deviations of returns. No, forget that. Debt versus equity has to do with the kind of information you're going to get, the kind of advice you're going to get. When you borrow money, what kind of advice will you get? Your banker will tell you all the different ways not to fail. Right? They could care less whether you succeed a little or succeed a lot. Because once you pay off that loan, they're good. OK? So all their concerns, they're, they're just, they leave you, as soon as you start driving off the cliff, they're like, hey, don't drive off the cliff. And then you're back off the, away from the cliff, and they're all good. OK? So that's not the kind of advice you want if you're a growth company. The kind of advice you want is how do you succeed big? OK? And that means equity holders, they're the ones because they have skin in the game. Okay, so they're the ones that want to see you succeed, not just a little, but a lot. So early stage companies always go for external equity financing. Okay, that's the secret there. Go to equity. And then the third question is, do you want public equity or private equity? Now, of course, we all fantasize at some point of going IPO. Hey, IPO is great, right? That's when we 
hit it rich, that's how we get liquidity and so forth. But there are serious drawbacks to being a public company. There are advantages and disadvantages. What are the advantages? The main advantage of being a public company is that you tap into, again, think of advice. You tap into advice from millions and millions of people. When you're private, you're tapping into the advice of half a dozen people, a dozen people. Now, which is better, the advice of a million people or the advice of a dozen people? If you had an MBA, if you had spent one day at the Haas School of Business, you would know the answer to this question. It's the answer to every single question, which is, it depends. <laughs> it depends. So I have this exercise that I do in my class where I pass around a bag of coins, I ask everybody to guess how many coins there are in the bag, and uh, what I've discovered is that nobody is good at guessing the number of coins in the bag as individuals, but in the aggregate, they're quite good. Okay, this is something that was observed by Francis Galton way back in the day. Farmers were trying to figure out how much a cow weighed. They all sucked at it, but on average, they were really, really good. Okay, this is called the wisdom of the crowd. There's a lot of great examples of this. If you have the need to source information from millions and millions of people, then it's a great idea to be a public company. But when you're dealing with something that is brand new, when you're dealing with something that has never been done before, when you're dealing with something that is very uh, firm specific or new industry specific, there aren't a million people out there there aren't even like 200 you know, analysts out there that have the kind of information that is relevant to your success. Okay? So you want to source it from those folks who really understand your business. Furthermore, the problem with public equity is that people don't really have an incentive to invest a lot in the acquisition of relevant information. If you see some stock going south, what do you do? You sell it. Whereas in private equity, which includes venture capital, if you see a business heading south, <laughs> you start making some phone calls, right? The difference between public equity and private equity is like the difference between uh, dating and marriage. Okay, stockholders, these are the folks you date. Private equity investors, your venture capitalists, these are the people you're married to. They don't have a choice. They can't leave. They can't abandon you. They've got to work it out. Okay, so, so if you are a start, startup, you want private equity investment, which comes in the form of venture capital or angel money. Okay, so how do these VCs work, right? What is their uh, job? This is their job in a nutshell. They raise funds, they invest funds, they grow companies, they exit, fund, exit those companies, okay? And it's a cycle, rinse, wash, repeat. Okay, so this is how they raise the funds. They raise them through these limited partnership structure. Okay, the limited partners, these are the pension funds, the insurance companies, and so forth that plunk down the money. They're passive. The VCs, they are the, the general partners, right? They're the ones that make all the investment decisions. They manage the money. Okay, now if you want to know why VC is so uh, dominant in the Anglo-American legal system countries, I'm not including India here and Pakistan because even though they're anglo American legal system, you know, just try to get through the court systems in India and Pakistan, it's, it's, it's a disaster, right? But in the US and the UK, this is kind of where, uh, and you know, the, some Caribbean islands and other places, this is really where most of these things are domiciled, okay? And I remember I had these people come from a bunch of different countries like Turkey and Kazakhstan, and they would come to the US and they would say, we want to copy your VC law, right? How do we do it? We looked everywhere. We searched through all your laws and we can't find the VC law. And it's like, no, it's not VC law. It is corporate law, it's trust law, it's partnership law, and this stuff's been around since the 12th century, okay, in the Anglo-American world. There's no special law. It's just good, old-fashioned partnership law and corporate law, which, as you heard, right, from Bet, it is, you know, based in Delaware here in the U.S. We've got the, the highest quality, okay? So the, the structure, I don't need to get into. It's like this 2 and 20 structure. Okay, the money comes from all these funds. Okay, the reason why they do it is because they can get really good returns and so forth. Uh, but what I want to really, what I want to, what I want to do is I want to focus on the, um, on the uh, you know, the, what they have to do is they set up this fund. It's a 10-year fund. Within that fund, there's lots and lots of different uh, uh, portfolio companies that they invest in. So they find a deal. They do a Series A, Series B, maybe have an exit. Early years invest. 
mid-years grow, final years uh, harvest, okay? Uh, and so, so that's basically how it works. Uh, it's a hit-driven business, some successes, some failures. But I want to I wanna focus on, um, on this, because this is really how financing works and how valuation works within the VC space. How many of you have had like a basic economics course or finance course? How many have had intro to finance? How many have done capital budgeting, NPV, discounted cash flow analysis, all that stuff? Okay, you are disqualified from being a venture capitalist. Okay, if you have taken basic finance in a business school and learned about you know, how to do net present value valuation, you are automatically disqualified from being a venture investor. Because every single investment that a venture capitalist makes has a negative NPV using traditional valuation techniques. The valuation techniques that venture capitalists use, to the extent that they use one in a formal way, is what we call real option valuation. Okay, real option valuation, which bakes in the flexibility of expanding or contracting your investment, which typical traditional NPV valuation doesn't do. So let me give you an example of this. This is just a simple exercise that I would do if we had more time. Um, suppose that you're the head of R&D at a large pharmaceutical company, and you have to decide whether or not to invest in uh, a new drug. And uh, it can cost you $15 to develop the new drug. Uh, there is a three, there's a one-third chance that your uh, cost of producing the drug, because, you know, it's a brand new business. You don't know what it's going to cost to make the drug. Okay, so there's this uh, uncertainty here. You also don't know, like, whether anybody's going to buy the drug. And so this is the... The, the potential revenue associated with the drug. Now, how would a traditional finance person approach this problem? They would draw a decision tree where they would assign probabilities to the different costs and then assign probabilities to the, the revenue. And then they would come up with a valuation, which in this case is negative. And so they would say no to this investment. Because they'd say, look, you know, what if it costs a lot? What if we don't sell the drug? You know, hey, we can't do it. So in order for you to find this drug attractive, you have to resolve some of the uncertainty. So imagine that by doing the R&D, once you've spent the money on the R&D, you reduce the uncertainty somehow. So before you take the next step and actually produce the drug, you actually now know how much the drug is going to cost to produce. So now, what does this decision look like? It's going to look very different. In particular, if it turns out that the cost of production is really high, you just stop. You just don't go forward. And so the maximum that you would lose in that case is $15 million. Okay, You have eliminated the worst case scenarios by gathering information. So in traditional finance, you make the decision first, and then the uncertainty is resolved. In venture finance, the uncertainty is resolved before the investment is made. Okay, now think back to that staging of the investing. The whole point of staging the investing is that you are buying information. The venture capitalist is buying information from the entrepreneur. They're paying the entrepreneur to go out and resolve some uncertainty. Okay? The investments they make are not about ultimately building the business. They're about acquiring information which will allow them to figure out the best way to build that business. You as an entrepreneur are in the business of uncertainty reduction of information acquisition. That's how you need to think about it. And the investors, what they're buying from you is information which they can input into their decisioning model. Okay? That's the key thing. So this is the learning cycle that you're engaging. And this is from Steve Blank, right? You have a hypothesis. You test it in the market. Based on the results of that test, you then decide what to do next. Okay, so this is the Steve Blank thing. And this is why we often refer to this as prototyping, beta testing. You know, get stuff out as quickly as possible for the main purpose of gathering information. And by the way, this is why crowdfunding is now so attractive, because it's about right, getting some validation. I'll give you an example. I have a friend who's got this fantastic invention. Um, it's a super cool thing. It's, it's very simple. It's like a, um, a gigantic Band-Aid that you can stick uh, uh, ice, ice um, you know, these reusable ice things in. So if you, you know, injure your leg, now what you have to do is take a big Ziploc bag full of ice cubes and hold it on your leg. 
This thing, it's just a, like a big Band-Aid you put on your leg. It has ice in it. And you can walk around, and it's, it's fantastic, okay? And, and so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm investing in this thing. And I, so I said, to, I said to them, I said, I am only going to invest with you if you do the following, right? Instead of going out and building out your factory and building out your capacity and building out your marketing infrastructure, that's not, I don't want you to do that. I want you to launch a Facebook campaign, right, to find out if any of these folks who run these clinics, you know, will buy the product. He's like, but clinics are not my main business. You know, the hospitals are my main business. Shouldn't I be investing in, you know, building out an infrastructure to deal with the big hospitals and stuff? It's like, no, no. This, even though this is not your biggest market, this is where you can find out the information the fastest. It's going to take you a year to sell this stuff to hospitals, but you can put up a Facebook page and know within 48 hours whether or not there's demand for this product. And you can take that to the VCs and get money from the VCs, and then boom, my little angel investment will triple in value. Okay, that is how you need to think, getting information. So I'll end with this example. Um, this is Mark Andreessen, okay? You all know him because he's with Andreessen Horowitz, but his first claim to fame was Netscape. Here's a guy who designed Netscape from soup to nuts, A to Z, wrote all the code when he was a student at University of Illinois, right? It was a mosaic platform. He created this entire product. And when it went public, what percentage of the equity do you think he got? Give me a number. 10%? Remember, this is back in the original dot-com boom. 1996, I think it was, when they went public, or 97? 95. 95. Okay, 95. What do you think he got? 80%? No. He got 2.6%. Remember, this guy wrote everything. He did everything except raise the money. Okay? Look at the venture capitalist, James Clark, 25%. Okay? The other VC, 10%. James Barksdale. These guys are the ones that made all the money. Now let's fast forward to this guy, Evan Spiegel. Same exact thing. He wrote all the code, he designed the product, et cetera. They went public in 2016. What do you suppose he got? 5%? No. He got 44%. So what happened between 1995 and 2016? What happened is that the venture investing was de-risked. Because by the time the venture capitalists showed up, this guy already had like you know, three million users, okay? In other words, he was able to demonstrate that this product had legs right, before he got to start negotiating with the venture capitalists, okay? And that's good for the venture capitalists, too, because they have far fewer failures now because they can see, right, ahead of time whether or not this thing is going to scale. Okay, I'll give you one last example. Webvan. Webvan. That's .com 1.0. Couple billion dollars. Down the drain, nothing to show for this, okay? Now, what's wrong with the idea? Online grocery delivery. Is that a crazy idea? No, that's a brilliant idea, right? Online grocery delivery. Instacart, very successful. Instacart was just valued at about $4 billion last, uh, last round, okay? So what, what's the difference? Webvan said, before we can ship our first bag of groceries, we need to have warehouses, we need to have trucks, we need to have like a couple thousand employees, we need to have a marketing campaign, we need to have all this before we can do anything. Give us our billions. Instacart started with one guy who was an employee at Amazon and quit. Started Instacart. He himself was the one employee and he was delivering groceries with his own car. And when he got his first funding from Angels, he actually lied. He said there were two employees. He used his first name and he used his middle name. Okay? And he started with one store in one city and one truck and one employee. Okay? And then when he scaled to more stores, he got more money. And then more cities, more money. Right? So this is a completely different way of thinking about financing where each thing that you do is designed to validate your idea and so that the investors are, are de-risked. Okay, and that's the main takeaway I want you to, uh, to run with, which is that what you're producing is information, and what your investors are consuming is information, and what your investors are giving you, money is secondary, it's advice that they're giving you, and they can only give you good advice if you give them good information, 
And the advice that they're going to give you is related to you going out and doing experimentation. So think of yourself as chief experiment officer of your enterprise if you are an entrepreneur. OK? Anyway, happy to chat. I'll stick around for a little bit. Um, we're done, right? OK, thank you, Naeem. Thank you, Greg.